Didn't see it there. Let's talk about rotating diatomic molecules. Now to do this, we'll be using the rigid rotor model. So as you can see here, I have an equation for moment of inertia. And in this equation, we are actually using the rigid rotor system, where we have mass 1 and mass 2. We also have R1 and R2, which actually represents the lengths from the center of mass to the atom itself. Now, using these equations that are presented here, we can reconfigure this moment inertia equation into this right here, which is moment inertia equals reduced mass multiplied by r squared. Now note that r is basically the bottom length. And the, way it's, the reason I say this is because we have r1 and r2 summed together. Also note within this moment inertia equation that we have reduced mass. For reduced mass, it equals the atomic mass constant multiplied by mass 1 multiplied by mass 2 over the sum of the two masses. And also note that these masses are in atomic mass units. We can analyze the energy of a diatomic model using this equation for energy here. So, rotational energy equals h, which is Planck's constant, multiplied by c, which is the speed of light, multiplied by b, which is the rotational constant, multiplied by j, which is the angular momentum quantum number. Now, note this rotational constant. We have an equation for that, which is presented here with h of Planck's constant, 8 pi squared, the speed of light again, and then we have the moment of inertia. Now, we make reconfigure this equation using the equation we talked about previously about moment of inertia. Now, with substitution, we have this equation for B, where now we have the bond length and the reduced mass within the rotational constant equation. Now, if we want to find the bond length, what we do is we just simply isolate the R value, as you can see here. But we now analyze this model using the Bohr frequency condition. So as you can see here, we have delta E, which is the change of energy, equal Planck's constant multiplied by the frequency. Also note this other energy equation right here, which has h bar squared over 2 times i multiplied by j multiplied by j plus 1. Note that this h bar is Planck's constant over 2 pi. Now, with the combination of these two equations, we can isolate the frequency into this form right here. Now, we may reconfigure this form using the rotational constant equation, which we talked about previously. And substituting that in, what we receive is the equation for the frequency, which equals 2 times the rotational constant multiplied by parentheses the j, con the j plus 1. And also note that j, which is the angular momentum quantum number, equaling 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on and so on as its possibilities. So, for our rigid rotor system, the only transitions allowed are only between the adjacent states of the quantum number. As you can see here, I marked it down, where we have delta j, the change of the quantum number, equals plus or minus 1. So what we have here is a general sketch of what we should expect the spectrum to be where the x-axis is going to be wave numbers, which is the inverse of the wavelength. <clears throat> now, each one of these markings here are the peaks, and as you can observe, that they're all equally spaced by separation of 2 times the rotation constant. Now, the rotation constant here is essentially the same thing as those we talked previously, except this rotation constant is going to be in units of <coughs> inverse centimeters. Okay, we can also observe the strongest transition in terms of the transitional frequency using the rotational term constant. Now observe here that this is the equation for the rotational term constant in terms of j, which is b times j multiplied by parentheses j plus 1. Now, note that the strongest transition is going to be the rotational term value as a function of j plus 1 
indifference of the rotational turn value <coughs> as a function of j. All right, so we may now use these equations for f in terms of j plus 1 and also f in terms of j. And we just substitute the equation and just use some simplification to receive what we've calculated before previously, that the transitional frequency in terms of j equals 2 times the rotational constant multiplied by the angular momentum quantum number plus 1. So we can calculate the rotational constant using our transition frequency equation, as you can observe here. So if we do so when we do this experiment, we can have in the y-axis the transitional frequency versus the quantum number plus one. We should expect experimentally to have a line transition such as here, which is somewhat linear. Now the slope, as you can see from this equation, should equal to b. So if we can extrapolate the slope of this experiment, we can easily find that the rotation constant equals the slope of the graph divided by 2. Now, this transitional frequency equation is not perfect. So as we can see here, we have the original equation with frequency equaling 2b multiplied by j plus 1. Now we have to add a correction term right here, which is the negative 4 multiplied by d multiplied by, in parentheses, the j plus 1 cubed. Now this d term is the centrifugal distortion constant. <clears throat> it's an independent variable which depends on the bond identity. We can calculate for d when, if we perform this experimentally. And as you can see here, what we have for the y-axis, when we graph the data, that we have the frequency over j plus 1 versus j plus 1 squared. We should expect a trend line such here, where we have the slope equaling negative 4d, and the intercept will have to be 2b. So, I modified the previous transitional frequency equation to match more with what we're talking about in the graph. <clears throat> so you can see here we have the frequency over j plus 1 equaling this equation here, where we have 2b being the y-intercept, the negative 4d being the slope, as you spoke of on the graph, and then the x simply being the j plus 1 squared. So we can relate the absorbance spectrum to this energy level diagram here, where the y-axis is the rotational energy levels. And as you see here, each level, 0, 1, 2, and so on, are the j values, which is the angular momentum quantum numbers. <clears throat> so as you can see here, as the wave number value increases of the spectrum, what we what we observe is that the energy differences increase, increase. So as you can as you can observe, the rotational energy difference increases as the wave number is at higher values. And note that wave number is essentially frequency divided by the speed of light. It is also wave inverse wavelength. Here, I mapped out the centrifugal distortion constant. As you can see here, the constant relates directly to the rotational constant as well as the vibrational wave number. So, this d constant is mainly dependent on b, which is the rotational constant, which we spoke of previously. The rotational constant is mainly dependent on i, the moment of inertia, or the moment of inertia depends on r, the bond length. Now, from this, noting that d has a relation to r, the bond length, we can extrapolate that the centrifugal force is actually changing the bond length. This means that as this dotted molecule rotates, what we have is actually the stress of the centrifugal distortion constants.
we have to include this term now in our polynomial equation, which we spoke of previously, as a correcting term. So this right here is the Nicolette Fourier transform interferometer. Through this apparatus, we are able to extract the rotational constant, which is correlated to the rotational energy transmissions and absorptions. So this figure right here is a Fourier transform interferometer. A Fourier transform is infrared spectroscopy, which takes IR radiation that passes through our sample. Some of the radiation is absorbed, and some of the radiation is transmitted through our, through our sample. The resulting spectrum is a molecular absorption and transmission, which creates a molecular fingerprint of our sample. So, there are no two spectrums that are ever alike, similar to a fingerprint, where there's no two fingerprints that are alike. A uh, Fourier transform spectrum is, is a mathematical function of time, which is transformed to a new function of frequency, which is in hertz, then modified into a new function of wave numbers, which is inverse centimeters. So this is the Granville Phillips Series 275 pressure gauge. So this black dial right here is the open and closed valve from the vacuum to the atmosphere. So as you see down here, it's the copper pipes, which is connected all the way to the vacuum. So I am dropping two drops of sulfuric acid into the NACL, which is in the round bottom class. And just keep it like that. The IR source goes to mirror A, and then to mirror B, to mirror C, to the beam splitter, where the beam splits into two. One is the fixed mirror, which is mirror D, and then the other mirror is a movable mirror, which is mirror E. They come back to the beam splitter where they recombine and constructively interfere going to mirror F and then to mirror G and then to the sample. From the sample goes to mirror H, then to mirror I, to mirror J, then to mirror K, and then to the detector. This figure right here is displays the simple spectrometer layout. The IR source is IR energy that is emitted from a glowing black body source. A black body source is silicon carbide resistance heater. From here, the beam goes to the beam splitter, where the beam splits into two, one going to the fixed mirror and the other to the movable mirror. The fixed mirror is a fixed lane, while the movable mirror is moves along an air track powered by nitrogen gas. Here, the beams recombine at the beam splitter, where they combine constructively. So as the beam exits the beam splitter, it goes along this optical path to the sample, down to the detector. The detector measures special, the special interferogram signal. The interferogram signal includes all information of every IR frequency from the IR source. The interferogram signal can't be directly interpreted, so it has to be decoded using Igor computer program, which uses a Fourier trend. The purpose of pumping down the chamber to about 1 to 2 torr is so that the IR radiation does not get absorbed by the water molecules, which will wipe our spectrum. Once we are at that pressure, we are able to take our spectrum on the Igor computer program. This figure right here displays how a Fourier transform spectrum is taken. So before we are able to take a spectrum of just our sample, a background spectrum must be taken. So there is a relative scale of the absorption intensity. A background spectrum removes instrumental characteristics so when our spectrum of our sample is taken, it is strictly 
just of HCl and DCl. Now, we are about to make two different plots in order to determine rotational constant and the centrifugal distortion constant. And this is the Excel file, and I am about to type j, j plus 1, j plus 1 square, and of course the wave number which we will get from the ego file. And I just type the j, j value from j equals 0 to j equals 13. And I'm typing j plus 1 value. And now j plus 1 square. It takes a while to type an equation and calculating. OK, almost done. And here, this is the eagle program. And I want to record the wave number from j equals 0 through j equals 13. And this is the spectrum of, of HCL. And it's hard to recognize the line j from j equals 0 to j equals 2. So I'm trying to find the delta x value to estimate j equals 0 to j equals 2. And I, I just place the cursor to determine the delta x. It seems like about 20 or something. And now I place the cursor to j equals 0 peak. And it's about 19.52. And the j, j equals 1 is about 39.3. And next, the j equals 2, which came out about 58.6. And I zoom out and I determine the wave number for rest of them. It seems like j equals 10 and j equals 11. j equals 12, and the last one, j equals 13. Now I'm typing the recorded wave number into Excel program. And next, I'm going to record the wave number values for DCL in the Eagle program. OK, I'm going to make a graph representing the wave number as a function of j plus 1 in order to get the rotation constant. First, uh, first, select all x and y values and click insert and click scatter and the plot looks pretty much, pretty much linear. And I did some simple linear fit. And I showed the equation and the I square value. Next, I am going to use the Linist method to get more accurate slope and intercept value. And I type the equation. Select all x value and then select all y value. And for this one, I need to keep the intercept zero. So select false. And next one, select true. And it's done. So the slope represent 
2 times the rotational constant. So this is the DCL spectrum and I determined the wave number from J equals 0 to J equals 13 just like I did for HCL spectrum. The one main difference is that delta X is about half of that for HCL. One problem in this spectrum is that it's even harder to identify the peak between J equals 0 and J equals 2, like I'm pointing it. To solve the problem, I just enter the wave number value starting with J equals 3. And I got the wave number as a function of J plus 1 graph. And I did a line fit to get the slope and intercept value to get the linear equation. And next, I plug in J plus 1 value to x to get the wave number for J equals 0 and J equals 2. So here's the graph representing wavelength mm, as a function of J plus 1 for HCL and DCL. Next, I made a graph representing wave number divided by J plus 1 as a function of J plus 1 square to get the rotational constant and centrifugal distortion constant. The, pro uh, the procedures of making the graph are pretty, mu pretty much similar with that for making previous one. Previous one. <coughs> but one difference is that I should not keep the intercept zero when I'm doing the Rani's function. And this is the intercept, which is not zero. And this is what I got for graph for H HCL and DCL. There is another way to get rotational constant and centrifugal distortion constant, which is polynomial least, least square fit. To do that, I enter the J values, V terms, and D terms, and observe the wave number values on Excel sheet. After entering these values, I performed Linus fit, and wave number values were selected as known y. And unlike the previous Linus fit, two different independent variables must be selected for known x, which are the column B and column C. And these are result of Rani's, Rani's fit. And this one is the centrifugal distortion constant. And this one is the rotational constant. So what you see here is a list of all the data that we've obtained throughout the experiment. And the way that we obtained this data was by using a Nikolai Fourier transform interferometer to analyze HCL and DCL. And in order to analyze this data, we first used a program called IGOR, where we did a Fourier transform. And we made sure that we examined the data from J equals 0 to J equals 13, where J is the angular momentum quantum number. We then used Microsoft Excel to calculate the different values here for the rotation constant and the centrifugal distortion constant. And in order to do that, we used three line spits. Two of the line of spits were to give us these two values here, both for HCL and DCL. And a third line of spit was to give us the polynomial fits, also for HCL and DCL. And you'll find that next to each of these values here, we have, in parentheses, percentages. And these percentages uh, represent the error from our experimental data and the literature value. And you can see these have little asterisks by them. And the literature values were found using the NIST website, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. The third column here represents the bond length, also known as the intranuclear separation. And you'll see that the units for that 
are angstroms, uh, unlike these two, which are in wave numbers. And in order to get the intranuclear separation, we had to use uh, the equation to solve for the rotational constant. And as you can see in this equation, we have a value here for the bond length. And so using that, we were able to find the different bond lengths for HCL and DCL. And also next to those values, we have the percent errors uh, of, uh, relative to the literature values. So the first pieces of information here we want to talk about relate to the rotation constant, which we have here in wave numbers. Now the first thing we can immediately see here when looking at these two values for the rotation constant, which are pulled out from that larger table that you saw before, is that the rotation constant of HCl is a lot bigger than the rotation constant for DCl. And the question we may ask ourselves is why is that true? And in order to answer that question, we take a look here at the equation for the rotation constant where we see that there's a factor here known as a reduced mass, which over here is written out as being the product of the two masses divided by the sum of the two masses. And over here I've solved that with the two reduced mass values approximately for HCl and DCl. And we can see here that the reduced mass of DCl is about twice the reduced mass of HCl. And if we look back over here at the equation for the rotation constant, we know that the reduced mass is in the denominator, which means that the rotation constant and the reduced mass are inversely related. Looking back at this equation over here, we see that the, that the rotation constant of HCl is about double the rotation constant of DCl, which makes sense given that DCl has about twice, again, the rotation constant of HCl. Thinking about this in terms of the actual atoms themselves, we know that atoms tend to rotate along their bonds, and the frequency of that rotation can be described by the rotation constant over here. And we know that if you increase the mass on one side of that bond, that the rotation frequency should also decrease. And in this particular case, it's going to decrease by about half as we go from hydrogen to deuterium. So the next piece of information that we're going to talk about here relates to the centrifugal distortion constant, which is denoted here by J or by DJ. And so what we see here are the two values for HCl and DCl. And the first thing we notice is once again the D value for HCl is a lot bigger than the D value for DCl. And the difference between these two values is more notable than it was when we're talking about the rotation constant because in the rotation constant, we saw that the B value for HCl was about twice the B value for DCl. But in this case, if you do the math, you find that actually the D value, the centrifugal distortion constant of HCl, is about four times the amount or the value for DCl. And the reason why that is relates to this equation here, which is how we define the centrifugal distortion constant which is equal to 4b cubed, b of course being the rotation constant, over nu squared, nu being the vibrational frequency in wave numbers. So over here I have the two equations for these two different variables. As we can see, we've seen this before, and over here for the vibrational frequency we have 1 over 2 pi times the square root of k, which is the force constant of the bond, over mu, which again is the reduced mass. And so I've plugged these two values, or these two equations here, in for b and nu over here. And through algebraic manipulation, I've simplified it down to this equation over here. And immediately we see that the reduced mass squared is inversely related to the centrifugal distortion constant. And before, when we were just talking about the rotation constant, we saw that it was just mu that was inversely related to the rotation constant. Mu squared is what would account for the fact that HCl, or the D value for HCl, is just four times, about four times larger than the D value for DCl. So it all makes sense here. And as a side note, it's important to know what the centrifugal distortion constant even is, and what the centrifugal distortion constant describes is how easily a bond distorts 
as a result of centrifugal force being applied to it. In finishing up this report, I want to go ahead and talk about error analysis a little bit here. In one of my previous slides, I'd already talked about the different percent errors that we had comparing our experimental values for the rotational constant and the centrifugal distortion constant, as well as the bottom lines. And here, I have them written out again, only this time in terms of standard deviations. So here we have the standard deviation of the rotational constant, we have the standard deviation of the centrifugal distortion constant, and we have the standard deviation of the bond length. And as you can see, these are pretty small values, which indicate that we have pretty small error. So the results that we've gotten from this experiment were pretty good. Some of the reasons for this error could be due to minor molecular vibrations, which would result in less precise data because the molecules themselves are constantly moving. And so now that we've talked about some of the errors associated with the experiment, the next thing we may ask ourselves is where are these errors coming from? They're coming from errors from mistakes in the laboratory or pr problems with the method, or are they coming from the, the uh, equipment? And well, there are a couple of ways you can determine what errors, if any, are coming from the equipment. And one of those ways is by switching out the spectrometer. And ideally, if we switch the spectrometer to another one, the numbers should be pretty much the same. If we notice that there are large differences in the data that's being obtained after switching out the spectrometers, we can start to assume that there may be some issues with the spectrometer. It may be defective or faulty, and that could be a significant source of error. The next thing we can do is we can test other samples besides just HCL and DCL, such as HFDF or HIDI, and compare those values to NIST, and we should be able to also see pretty close values from our experimental data and the literature values for these samples as well. And this is good because it allows us to see if our experimental method works for other samples and not just HCL and DCL. And finally, we can analyze larger ranges of J, J of course being the angular, or the angular momentum quantum number, and by analyzing a larger range of values, we should be able to reduce the variance and therefore reduce the error. So to collect a sample of our data, you will use two waves for data collection. The first is a temporary repository for data input, labeled input zero, and the second wave will add together several scans of input zero and be labeled data two. Now we will have to set data two wave to zero. Let's copy this command and paste it. Delete this extra. This will initialize the data storage for an array in preparation for a run. Now we will collect using a scan and sum macro. This command tells the computer to collect data from the AD card and store the collected data in the temporary wave name input zero. So we'll just scroll up, select scan and sum, data to one. This will take one scan. And you'll hit enter. Once the scan is actually collecting, a beach ball will appear in the down left corner to show it is being taken. Now we will display our data to Fourier transform. Let's copy this command, paste it. And this is it right here. So from our signal, as you see above, and a Fourier transform of the data, which is below. We can now see the spacing between the peaks using Control-I.